home now after that song. And did we really just announce that if you're going to the bar, you need to get there before 9? Is that what we said in church tonight? Well, that was the restaurant part. Gotcha. Gotcha. Let's all pass the bar. Like Brother Richard, he passed the bar. What year did you pass the bar, brother? What century was it? <laughs> now we'll all be passing the bar with you, brother. <clears throat> all right, we are back in Nehemiah chapter 2 for one last part of Spiritual Gifts Leadership, part 3. Hey, if you need one of these handouts, where are our handouts, brother? Or raise your hand if you need one. We might have got them out. <clears throat> Do you have the handout from the last couple of weeks? If not, raise your hand. We will get that to you. We do have some extra pins somewhere, don't we? But if you're in the room and have one, raise your hand if you need one. If you got one, hand it to him. If not, Brother Chris may have some more. All right. Well, I appreciate your attendance and faithfulness here on uh, National COVID Weekend, COVID-19 Weekend. And um, you being here on a Sunday night means a whole lot. We're going to go easy on you as a reward for that. Just going back over what we've gone over about leadership. First of all, raise your hand if you're a leader in some regard in your life. Raise your hand. And if you don't have it up, raise it anyway because yes you are. You are a leader at some level. And this is the one spiritual gift which applies to every single one of us. Whether you have the gift or not, there's so much that we can learn about leadership. And forgive me as we go through this as there's so many personal pastor illustrations. It's what I have to draw on, and it's not trying to always talk about myself or even lift up my position, but it's using examples and illustrations uh, that work for me and that might, might be helpful than to you. Remember the definition of the gift of leadership is that special ability to lead and organize a portion of the body of Christ for service. And Nehemiah is our example. And if you don't have all the blanks filled in, I'm going to fly through these first few as a quick review. Leaders think differently. And how do they think differently? Number one, they think Continually, the motor's always running. And number two, they think outside the box in terms of continual progress, thinking in terms of success. It will succeed. And they say it'll work, and things go wrong, and they say it'll work out, and people will follow. Setbacks will occur. Resources will come. Um, last week, letter B, leaders bring others along, which means the journey goes slower, which means the responsibility is greater because you're responsible for those who are followers of you. Number three, it's worth it. Leadership is worth it. Letter C, <clears throat> leaders have a willingness to endure criticism in order to accomplish the ultimate task. And we said last time, most of us would rather be ruined by praise than helped by criticism. But you've got to have that thick skin. D, leaders know when to delegate E, not afraid of making tough decisions and sticking with them. 
And so now we come to the final section, which is dangers. The dangers or the potential pitfalls to be careful of with leadership and to for us all to appreciate about one another, especially when you are following a leader in some area in your life. And we all do. Yesterday I was here with, with gloves on and ready to work and people were trying to look to me for what do we do and I said let's look to Miss Amy. Miss Amy was the leader. She was my leader and I was a follower and she really had to get on to me a couple times too. But I picked it up and, uh, and sucked it up. Dangers of leadership. Number one, our delegation is often misunderstood as a lack of concern. Because a leader must delegate, and they must, even at the risk of being misunderstood, but we should try not to be misunderstood as unconcerned. And that's one of the dangers to try to avoid. But it's extremely important for a leader to delegate, to be free, to ask for help, and to get other people to do things. <clears throat> uh, who was it? Uh, maybe D.L. Moody said, I'd rather teach a hundred men to work <clears throat> than do the work of a hundred men. <clears throat> we can get so much more done, and so even at the risk of being misunderstood, Leaders must delegate and get more done, not try to do it all themselves. Nehemiah not only had to repair the broken down walls all around Jerusalem, but all 12 of the gates. And we that are uh, leaders should show concern for the followers. And those who are followers should realize that just because a leader delegates doesn't mean that they don't care. Leaders need to do just like Nehemiah and lead the way by example, too. Nehemiah had a sword in one hand, we see in one verse. He had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. He was fighting some off that were after him. He was still doing the work himself, being an example, not just do as I say, but do as I do. Not telling people, hey, you guys follow Christ, but saying, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And if I don't, then don't follow me, but still follow Christ and follow any leader that follows Jesus. Well, pastors are at risk because they can only do so much. You have to delegate. You have to learn to say no. You have to learn to limit some things in order to do your job well. But inevitably, someone will see a leader delegating and will say, they don't care. Uh, personal example, I need to do all I can to show that I care. But you reach a certain point where you show that you care in another way. I care enough not to let myself get burned out. I've got to do that. We're at a difficult stage now as a nation and as a community and right now as a church. Somebody was coming up to me this morning and saying, you know, I bet it's hard for you to not be shaking hands and to not be hugging some necks like you're used to, but you are important to be well and to be around. And so I commend you for doing that. We can't lose our health uh, any more than we could uh, lose our family. These things are all important to remaining pastor here. For instance, if I work like a dog and save several marriages and lose my marriage, it's over, right? My ministry is over. And um, it was Billy Sunday who in his latter years wrote that he turned to his wife as they were in their easy chairs of retirement and said, Maud, we won the world and we lost our boys and were failures. That's sad, isn't it? To come to the end of your life in ministry and feel like I did so much that was urgent for everyone else and really my main mission field, which is sitting down here and back here in the booth, I lost them. Not worth it. If I work so hard trying to please everyone that I burn out, I will have pleased a lot of people for a few months and then blown the 30 years that I had to go. 
can't do that. It's a necessity for a good leader to delegate, and followers need to understand that and understand that it's not a lack of concern. But this message is not just teaching followers how you need to better understand us leaders. It's a challenge to leaders. Try to understand that you need to be concerned and you need to come across as concerned. And even when you delegate, you need to send that message. And even when you challenge someone, you need to send the message that you love them and you aren't just bossing around and giving orders all over the place. Now the fact is, in the church, I want things done first class, but you can only do a couple of things and do them well. And you can't do it all at once, and you can't do it all in a hurry. Uh, somebody remind me, how do you eat an elephant? Yeah, it's just one bite at a time, right? And we've got an elephant to eat here. And so, a bite at a time, we work on things a little bit at a time. Or you can try to do everything and do it all poorly. Um, I could spend a few minutes on a project and do a poor job of it. Or I could delegate it to someone who can dedicate some real time to that and invest some time and it'll be done right. They say the successful leader surrounds themselves with people who can do jobs better than they, the leader, can do. And we have a lot of people here who can do just that, do so many things better than I can do for the sake of the ministry. That's exciting for the future. Now leaders need to remember this, that perception is reality. That is, for the person who's perceiving something, it's their reality. You don't, as a leader, you don't want to be perceived as being unconcerned. Uh, so we challenge followers to be understanding, but what if they're not? Leaders, we've got to step up there in showing more of our concern. Um, what are some things we can do to help avoid seeming to be unconcerned? You know, though it shouldn't have to be necessary in order to exist and in order to function, a leader can stop and send a simple text saying thank you for what you did. And doesn't that send a message right there? And how long did that take? You can make a phone call or drop in or send that email or that card. A leader may not be able to be at every viewing, every visitation, or the funeral of every person's aunt's second cousin once removed, right? Uh, but if you can send the message, hey, I'm there in spirit, I'm concerned, I wish I could be there, I care, you've just taken a moment and really made some efforts to show that concern. So that's all under number one, <clears throat> delegation being misconstrued as a lack of concern. Number two, another danger to avoid, a willingness to endure criticism may appear as being callous, callousness. Uh, <clears throat> Because leaders are willing to endure criticism, they can seem like they're just pretty rough. I said earlier leaders have to have thick skinned. They're not deterred by criticism, and oftentimes then they look hard hearted or like they're calloused. Leaders can't have the luxury of constantly wallowing in self pity every time they're criticized. And for that reason, some people say, well, I just need to heap some more criticism. It doesn't seem to be working. I'll go into overdrive on this then. That person doesn't seem phased by just normal criticism, so let's really pile it on. For years, I did a radio ministry, and boy, did we get letters, hateful letters. And uh, at first, I would try to read them, and boy, that could... That could break a person down here in criticism and negativity and all of that. We finally wound up just putting those straight into the trash. With my online ministry of, of grace notes, it only compounded then in later years. It's every day that there's an email of somebody who's going to correct me doctrinally or, or whatever. Uh, that are just full-time critics. They've made uh, a life out of it. So uh, file 13 with that sort of thing. 
but you don't want to seem calloused either. Um, <clears throat> some people say, don't you care what others think? Isn't it important to you how you're perceived? Aren't you worried? Or sometimes, do you feel misunderstood? Do you feel abused? The answer to all the above is yes. But most important, as we said last week, is that we're right with God and that He's smiling. We've got to get back to performing for the audience of one. Again, not trying to please everyone all the time. So, we have to make decisions sometimes that aren't popular. And then after that, if God led that decision, leave it in God's hands. God is your defender. He's a good defender. You know what? God can defend you better than you can defend yourself. I've seen that over and over in my ministry. Look at how Nehemiah responded when he was criticized. We're in Nehemiah. Let's slip over to uh, chapter 6 of Nehemiah. And in chapter 6... We're jumping ahead just a little in our text. Look at verse number 3. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. They were trying to get him off the wall. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Um, when Nehemiah was criticized, he said, I could spend a lot of time trying to oil every squeaky wheel that comes along. But instead, I'm going to use that time to do the work that God has called me to do. That's what he said here. I'm doing a great work. Why should the work cease while I come deal with you? You know, you can argue on somebody's doorstep for hours, when it, and when it's apparent that that person only wants to win you to their, their belief, it's time to just do what Jesus did and go like this. Shake the dust off your feet and move on to someone who realizes that they need your help and are looking for it. <clears throat> now, sometimes criticism will hit you close to home. When it's not a stranger on a doorstep. When it's right in the family, in the house of God. When it's a brother or a sister. But strong leadership isn't chopped down by the dullest blades that come against it. And that's why we oftentimes can look callous. So we need to be aware of that and try to show that tender underbelly. You see, good leadership learns its weaknesses, learns its liabilities, considers these potential dangers, likely misperceptions, and how to avoid those misperceptions. And so leaders all across the room, and we just said that's all of you, delegate where you need to, show you're concerned, endure criticism with that thick skin, but let everybody see a soft heart underneath. Try not to appear calloused. And now number three. There's another danger to avoid, and that is pride. The danger of becoming prideful. The Bible says so much about pride, doesn't it? Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride shall bring him low. Isn't that ironic? Pride, which is supposed to lift you up, brings you low. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. With our Lord, the way up is down, isn't it? We see that in Philippians 2. He, he made himself come down, Philippians 2 says, right? Let's just turn over there real quick. Hold your place there because we will be back. Look at Philippians 2. I want to get this wording right because this just comes to heart right now. And in Philippians 2, verse number... Six, speaking of Jesus, says, Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery or a thing to be uh, grasped after, to be equal with God, that's to stay up, but made himself of no reputation, that's to go down, and took upon him the form of a servant, that's going down, made in the likeness of men. God becoming man would be like you or me becoming an ant. You know? He went down, verse 7. Verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, he did what? 
What's the next word? Verse number 8. Are you in Philippians 2? Verse number 8. Being found in fashion as a man, he did what? He humbled himself. He went down, becoming obedient unto death of the cross. Verse 9. Wherefore God hath highly, what? With God the way up is down. The way to be full is to empty yourself. The way to live in His economy, to die to yourself. These are wonderful truths that we oftentimes miss. Now back in Nehemiah, what a danger of becoming prideful. The Bible says, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift thee up. Lift yourself up, oh, he's able to abase those that walk in pride, Daniel 7 says. Leadership can so easily breed pride. Um, back to a pa pastor illustration. I just got to remind you folks, Satan wants to take out men of God. There's a big bullseye on my head, on that man's head, Brother Chris and others who are trying to serve God in the ministry, because you take out the head and you kill the body is his plan. He's taken out a lot of my friends by convincing them that they were something that they were not. Um, I said in my book, if we forget who we used to be, we cease to be who we think we are. <laughs> we think we're something because we forget about the pit from which we were taken. And we forget that without Him, I am nothing. Nothing. Satan's taken out a lot of friends of mine who thought they were above temptation, thought they were stronger than that. And they gave in to it. And they disqualified themselves for the ministry. Satan has taken out friends of mine who decided things were going good in their ministries and they were going to take the credit for that. And God says, Nah, -uh. I won't share my glory with you. He's the only one worthy of glory. Amen? He won't share it with man. And I'm reminded, and I remind you tonight, that there is no limit to what God can do in our midst here at First Baptist of New London if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. And if God gets all the glory for it. You give man the glory, you put a man on a pedestal, you're setting him up for a fall, and thus yourself for a fall as well. And that's why Satan tries these things. Because people are following the leader, and they may follow him even to their own demise. More people have been destroyed by success than failure ever thought about hurting. It takes a special person to be able to handle success, to handle authority and leadership. You know, some leaders get that Barney Fife syndrome. You know what I'm talking about when I say the, the Barney Fife syndrome? You know how when he goes... Well, I can't do the voice. My son's good at voices. Maybe he can work on his Barney Five for us. You get just a couple deputies under you, like Gomer and Goober. And you can be like Barney and decide, I want to put my feet up on the desk. While Andy's gone, I'm going to be a big shot and throw my weight around. Andy left Barney in charge in one episode, and as soon as his tail lights were out of sight, he turned to his two deputies and, and a couple people in the jail and said, You heard him. I'm in charge. Now hop, two, three, four. Turns to the prisoners. Here at the Rock, we have certain rules. Yeah, the Rock. <laughs> I've been in those cells. We, we lived, what, 30 miles from Mayberry. Uh, for a short while there in North Carolina. It's not the rock, Barn. <laughs> Be careful of the Barney Fife syndrome. And leaders, remember that the God who promoted you can bring you down. Number four, <clears throat> leaders need to avoid this danger of trying to lead from a shaky platform. A shaky platform. I wouldn't be comfortable up here if this was built on 
matchsticks or tongue depressors. I was under this platform yesterday a little bit, and it's well built and things are in place. Otherwise, I'd be down there on the slab. That's a slab out there, right? I'd be more comfortable down there. Leaders need to lead from the right platform, and we're using this as an illustration. You can't lead from a shaky platform, and I want to give you some shaky platforms, figurative platforms that some try to lead from. Number one, the platform of personal charm. Personal charm. This person has gotten used to their personality being able to do all the work for them, and if they're personality plus, people follow them because of their magnetism, their personal charisma, uh, they're so compelling, but no character, that's a shaky platform, right? Uh, if the, your walk doesn't match your talk, if you don't practice what you preach, are you with me tonight? That's a shaky platform, the platform of personal charm. Eventually people see through the leader who's all suit and no underwear. <clears throat> Get the illustration? <laughs> Please don't imagine it. I'm just saying, understand the illustration. Some people are motivational, challenging, but they don't live it because there's nothing underneath it all. That's a shaky platform to just try to do it from outward charisma. There's got to be something deeper than that. How about popularity? Number two, popularity. The leader who tries to lead from the platform of popularity tries to keep the majority on his side all the time, keep everybody happy, don't offend anyone, constantly stroking egos and kissing babies, now don't do that right now during Corona. Uh, <clears throat> the person who is trying to lead from popularity talks very positive all the time and thus they don't talk a lot about sin or hell, they avoid controversial subjects. They try not to offend anyone, and guess what, folks? Ironically, when you try not to offend anyone, you know what happens? Let me see. You offend your very best people who desperately want their leader to stand for something, to step on some toes. We're not just here to be a display case for saints. We're a hospital for sinners. So you can't lead from the shaky platform of popularity or personal charm. And don't worry, uh, Tobias, I send a lot of people out crying. <laughs> How about the shaky platform of programs? Programs. This leader tries to keep everyone busy. If we've got something going on constantly at all times and everyone has to be involved in everything, well, they won't have time to gossip, gossip and gripe. <laughs> It's a shaky platform that leads to burnout of God's people. This kind of leader will even try to excuse what they're doing by saying, remember, idle hands are the devil's workshop. But listen, do God's people have to be out of breath all the time? Aren't we supposed to rest in the Lord sometimes? Be still and know that He is God sometimes? Sometimes we're just supposed to, in the stillness of the moment, commune with our Lord. And wouldn't you like to have some stillness sometime in your life? My wife said, you know, if I get this virus, maybe I'll just be alone for a couple of weeks. <laughs> God, give me the virus. So if you see her like licking door handles and <laughs> picking up used chewing gum and stuff, you'll understand. Now in the ministry of youth, my brother back there in the booth, Brother Chris, knows that keeping them busy is good, right? It's good to keep them busy, idle hands, all of that. But you know, I appreciate about Brother Chris something. It's not just keeping them busy. It's, he understands it's about teaching them to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and a personal commitment to God the Father that goes deeper than just this program, you know? It's not just about having the program. It's a shaky platform if it's just built on that. Next, the platform of causes. 
causes. <clears throat> Let's fight the latest political cause. Now that can be good within certain bounds, but overindulgence in causes can lead to the causes becoming a substitute for genuine spirituality. Some fight for prayer in school, I'm all for that. Some fight spirit, uh, some of them fear, some people feel spiritual because of fighting for whatever their cause is. Um, but you know, sometimes I perceive that that person who's fighting for prayer in school doesn't have much of a prayer life themselves. Now you need to have both, right? If you're going to have that cause, it needs to be built on a better platform. A little more discipline and personal, uh, uh, personal awareness there. Back in Decatur, Illinois, where we were for several year, for 14 years, uh, they had a big thing. If you remember the whole argument about is it sexual orientation or sexual preference, right? And the city wanted to change that their non-discrimination laws were written take away sexual preference, which implies what? That that person prefers to go in a different direction sexually, to sexual orientation, which means I was born this way, right? And so we thought that was a worthy one to, to stand up against. And we fought against that one. Back in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, when I was an assistant pastor, they basically decided to start selling beer at our local uh, uh, 5,000 seat uh, auditorium. We would do our living Christmas tree there each year and have more than that uh, in attendance in several different uh, shows there. And now they're going to turn it into a 5,000 seat tavern? We stood up against that. And you know what? It was pretty exciting because hundreds of our people came out for those things. And any time that you say, come pray for America, like we did this morning, the altar's full like it was this morning. And I guarantee if I said tonight, we're praying against abortion, the altar would be full. We will come out for different causes. But what if the cause is to be closer to Jesus Christ? Yeah, I'll just sit here. You know what I mean? Is there not a cause, David said? There's a bigger cause than any of these causes, and that's knowing Christ and making Him known to others. That's got to be our main thing, and we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. How about the shaky platform of self-promotion? Self-promotion. <clears throat> that kind of leader focuses everything on themselves. Bragging, elevating themselves. They're the hero of every story they tell. Developing followers of themselves rather than followers of the Lord. But when that leader's faults throw th show through, then the platform falls. We need to be transparent. We need to show our faults. We need our people to know that we have weaknesses and that we're trying to grow in them. Now that's a good platform. Credentials. We're almost done. The platform of credentials is a shaky platform. I've got a degree, therefore you should follow me. Well, listen, a degree may get you in the door, but once you're in that door, uh, it's just a wall decoration. <laughs> it's time to prove yourself. It's time to start leading. Now, did you know, I've mentioned Moody and Sunday tonight, D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday. Neither of them graduated from high school. Let me tell you about another preacher from yesteryear who never even graduated high school was Curtis Hudson. How many of you know the name Curtis Hudson? You know who I'm talking about. Uh, never graduated high school, built a great church, was given an honorary doctorate. They asked him how he felt about it, and I love what he said. It's like the curl in a pig's tail. It's kind of cute, but it don't make no more pork. It's just a wall decoration, right? Yeah. Last one. This is the big one. The, plat the shaky platform of assumed authority. This kind of leader thinks that they're a strong leader because of how strong they pour on their leadership. They're a dictator. They come in and let everybody know, I spell pastor with a capital P. And you will do what you're told to do. And the only group of people you can lead that way is a group with no self-esteem, beaten down people, lorded over people. Uh, 
but you'll never lead anyone to do something great for God with a dictatorial style of leadership. It's resented. It's not effective. People like to know they're respected. Don't you like to know that you're respected as a person? People like to know that their opinion matters, or is at least considered. Yeah. You ask people in the job market what they want. Better pay? They might say yes to that. Benefits? Yes. More vacation time? Absolutely. But you know what's the number one on the surveys? More respect. More respect from the boss man. The only platform from which you can lead that is stable and not shaky is the platform of respect. The platform of respect. And Paul said to young Timothy, his protege in 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Basically, he said two things. First of all, he said, kid, respect doesn't have to do with age, but respect is not a gift. Don't expect people to just give it to you. And especially because of your age, it must be earned. Earned respect is the one stable platform from which we should lead. If people respect you, they will follow your leadership. Get this. If people respect you, they will follow your leadership even if they don't personally like you. Brother, you've got quite a few employees uh, where you're at, right? Do they all like you? <laughs> Lying in church. <laughs> people will like you. People will respect you even if they don't like you. If you're a good leader, you may rub them the wrong way sometime. They may disagree at times, but good leadership earns respect. Earns respect. Many times you make difficult decisions if you're a good leader, and the easy decision to make would be the path of least resistance but you take a stronger path well who doesn't respect that you could have taken the easy way out but you took a harder path and so leaders be careful about what platform from which you lead don't do anything to undermine respect what can we do to undermine respect uh, a bad attitude undermines respect being calloused and being unconcerned undermines respect. Poor example by a leader, poor attendance by a leader undermines their own respect of their position that they hold in the church. Half-hearted devotion, procrastination, tardiness, these things all undermine our respect. I'll say this and we'll be done. Leadership is one of the spiritual gifts. It's no more important no less important than any of the other spiritual gifts. But we all are leaders at some level, and I pray that these principles from God's Word are a help and blessing. Lord, tonight, you are our leader.